dreams just random images fired from an unconscious brain during sleep? Or something much more important, like life-saving inner guidance? How dreams can be healing and early warning tools for disease, financial crisis, or success. And love is still one of the behavioral science's greatest unanswered questions. Hello, I'm your host, author Kat O'Keefe Cannabis. Welcome to Dreaming Healing, where dreams and cutting-edge scientific research meet on syndicated Dream Vision 7 radio network. Dreaming Healing is every Tuesday at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. Eastern, with live shows on the first and third evenings at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, when you can call in and ask Kat questions about your amazing dreams. Talk on air. Call toll-free 833-220-1200. That's 833-220-1200. Come live your dreams out loud with Kat. Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad you're here. Let's start the show tonight again with our favorite protection and clearing meditation. During this meditation, for those of you who are are new to the show, we're going to imagine using something that is small but powerful to you. Maybe it's something given to you in a dream um, by your guardian, angel, or, or maybe even a spirit guide or even a deceased loved one. It can be something like an amulet or jewelry. So if you don't have one, imagine holding your favorite flower or a crystal in your hand. Anything that holds the power of love for you. That's your power gift. Okay, now sit comfortably. And if you're driving in a car right now, just listen. Do not close your eyes. Together, we're going to take three deep breaths in and hold them. So anything that is not of our highest and best is captured in that breath of life. Then we're going to blow it out across the rim into the purple flame of St. Germain, where it's going to be converted into positive light and return to the universe. We are not going to litter. Then we're going to build that protection bubble around ourselves using our power gift. Okay, ready? Ready? All right, feel yourself relaxing, going deeper and being really centered. Now take in a deep breath. Hold it. Blow it out across the room, right into that purple flame of St. Germain, all the way out. Again, deep breath in. Imagine tiny specks of negativity sucked into that breath. Now blow it out into the flame. One more time. Really deep this time. Hold it in. Blow it out across the room. Into the purple flame of St. Germain. Where you see it turned into positive, beautiful, golden light. That is then returned to the universe. Now. Imagine your power gift is in your hand and imagine swinging it around your head and your body to create a mirrored bubble of protection that only lets that which is of the highest and best and brought by your spirit guides or guardian angels into that bubble. Anything else that is not of our highest and best is reflected back from whence it came. We wish it so and therefore it is. Okay, our dream question today came from Brenda, and she wanted to know, can I learn my own dream language, or do I need a dream dictionary? Okay, yes, Brenda, you can learn your own dream language. Dictionaries are great if you're totally stumped, but if you write your dreams down in a journal and watch for recurring words, plays on words or pictures that elicit emotions, it's your inner self teaching you your dream language. Okay, you're learning to communicate with yourself through the sacred dream doors. So those things that elicit emotion from you mean something to you, but they may mean something totally different to someone else. And that's where learning your dream language is really important. It it makes you aware of your language that you're speaking to yourself. So I know that might sound a little confusing. And to learn more about this, open the book Dreams That Can Save Your Life to Part 4, 
Developing Your Own Dream Skills, Chapter 30, page 164. You'll see E of the acronym So Dream, and E is emotion, and will help you learn your dream language. So um, Dreams That Can Save Your Life is my book. It's on my website. You can find it quickly by simply typing in the words The Queen of Dreams into Google. It will take you right to my website. Life is really challenging. You know, it is a bed of roses with really big thorns. And our dreams can help us navigate the turbulent waters and thorny roses of life. Both of our guests tonight will share first-hand personal tried-and-true experiences, tips, and keys to life. You may have seen one of our guests tonight, Jim Phillips, on my video podcast, The Cat Cannabis Show, live on New Earth TV. If not, you can go to my Facebook page, Kathleen O'Keefe Cannabis, author, and watch it at your convenience, or the Facebook page, The Cat Cannabis Show. That's K-A-T. K-A-N-A, V as a Victor, O-S as in Sam. Very close to the stuff you smoke, I know. People say it to me all the time. So our two guests tonight are both authors and experts in their field of health and wellness. Jim Phillips, and that's P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S, had an experience in church that changed his life forever. And he's here to share his wisdom on the keys to life, how to live in full expression, which is especially important to anyone in crisis. Our other guest, James Templeton, and that's T-E-M-P-L-E-T-O-N, healed himself of a terminal cancer diagnosis of stage 4 melanoma using diet, lifestyle changes, and my favorite, a miracle mindset. He literally snuck out of the hospital at night under cover of darkness and started his own journey to healing. Welcome to the show, Jim and James. Thank you very much. Hi, Kat. So How are you? Good, Jim. So glad to hear your voice again. Um, let's start with you, Jim. Tell us okay. about your experience in church and how it changed your life. Well, I was 13 years old and born and raised Christian. And I was sitting in church with my parents, and for whatever reason, my siblings were not there, and I'm not quite sure why that is. But I was sitting in between my parents. My dad was on my right. My mom was on my left. And I remember looking up at the front of the church. The minister was up there, and he was finishing up his sermon. And I noticed some folks over to my left that were getting ready to stand up and and pass the offering basket. And I remember just feeling really uneasy. And it, it was just a feeling of something not being right. It wasn't about anything being wrong so much, but it was just something was off, and I I couldn't really place what it was. And I remember just kind of twitching around, and then I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm 13 years old. I'd probably rather be out playing baseball or doing something like that. But uh, in any event, stood there, I sat there and and just watched what was going on. And then all of a sudden, up to the right-hand side of my head, there was this voice, deep and clear, that said, you're going to be doing this someday. And I remember jerking my head up in the air over to the right, looking to see the source of the voice. Nothing was there. Neither one of my parents had moved, so it was an indication they didn't hear anything. Nobody around me seemed to hear anything. Minister was still up front. People were still over to my left. And obviously at 13 years old, I'm questioning now, am I crazy? Did I really hear that? And then I'm thinking, well, what does it mean I'm going to be doing this someday? I've just had this thought of all of this being uneasy. It just didn't feel good, and there's no way I'm going to be doing this. And then it was a minute or so later, that same clear voice, same place above my head to the right-hand side said, you're going to be doing it differently. And then I remember saying, I'm going to be doing what differently? It's not going to be standing in front of a church. I can assure you of that. And so I held that in from the age of 13. I was aware of it. I never told anybody. My parents didn't learn of it until my book came out about four years ago. And it was something that I was just always cognizant of. And when I would have an experience in my life where it would be, something where I'd be put in front of people. And this happened quite a few times when I was in my teenage years and in my 20s. I would be 
put in a position of being in front of people. They'd be asking me questions, and I would be able to answer the questions in a way that I thought was above beyond what I probably should have known at the time. It was certainly nothing that I had studied. And that happened off and on throughout my my teen years, 20s, and then I got into metaphysics when I was 24 years old, and I, I started speaking into my 30s because I got into the real estate business. But really, that changed my life only in that I was aware that there was something that I was supposed to do, and I wasn't aware what that was. And I can't say that I did anything intentionally from that point of being age 13 to really find out what it was. I was just more or less aware and paying attention to what life was presenting to me. Although I did always have a very strong desire to understand what humans are capable of and why some people appear to be given more than others. And I thought that was some, a bit of, 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 uh, injustice with that because why was I born here in the United States under the conditions I was and yet there's people being born all over the world in conditions that are are at best terrible and it just none of it made sense to me and then just fast forward I, I just uh, I started working with different people I got into coaching I had been speaking a lot through my real estate business and then from all of that came the book the key to life living in full expression so what, what did your parents think when they read in the book that you had heard this in church and you were looking around to see if they were talking? Well, the first comment they made was, why didn't you tell anybody? And the reason I didn't tell anybody was what happened when my parents asked me the question because they didn't believe me. And mm-hmm. honestly, I'm not so sure they do to this day. But none of that matters to me because mm-hmm. it just made me become aware of something that I felt that I was – here to do. And I'll say from that point of age 13, I did feel like there was a message that I was to bring forward and to more or less be the, the mouthpiece for it. And I, 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 that's what I'm doing. I'm, 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 mm-hmm. I've got some thoughts going through my head, but I mean, the main thing is that's what I'm doing. And I guess I could say that with the information that I've been given and what I share with people, it is changing people's lives. So I can say, okay, in some fashion. I am a minister. I am ministering to people, helping them change their lives, helping them live better lives, but I am definitely doing it differently than if I were standing in front of a congregation in church. Right. So, you know, uh, we, we all, all, all three of us have concerns about whether or not people were going to believe us when, when, when we made the changes we made, the lifestyle changes we made, um, our whole world changed. I mean, here I had, you know, dreams of monks coming into my dreams telling me I had breast cancer when the medical community was telling me I was healthy and to go home. And so, you know, Mm -hmm. I I experienced the same thing that that you did, Jim. I didn't want to tell the doctors I had dreams with monks coming into my dreams because they would have either given me a padded room or some kind of a really strong (laughs) medication. So, Jim, you mentioned in your, um, I'm sorry, James, you mentioned uh, that your life-changing nightmare kind of turned into a dream come true, and it started in your early 30s. You were this party boy turned fitness fanatic and runner, and then all of a sudden you're diagnosed with stage 4 melanoma, and that is, is serious. That must have been quite a shock. Were there any signs or dreams giving you any warning about this? Well, Kat, you know, uh, when I think back about this, when I was a little boy, I lost my mother before she, before I was two. And, uh, you know, for some reason or another, I remember laying in the bed when I was a little boy, and I always felt I was different than everyone else. I didn't look different. I didn't act different. But I felt there was something different about me than other people. And I always had this feeling that I was supposed to be some kind of a minister, you know, in in some way when I grew up. Uh, I felt there's this strong urge, you know, to do something, to help others. But that was when I was a little boy, and I would lay there and think about that. But after my father died when I was in high school, and I had a brother also die when when uh, he was only eight, well, I had so much death in my family that I had almost given up thinking that I was next. I felt like I was going to be the next one and uh, end up, 
you know, maybe not making it to 30 years old. So I had this kind of what's the use.